Today's episode of the Gold Cast is sponsored by ACL Replacements. Do you have an ACL or MCL that you don't need? Well, guess what? The 49ers could use yours. Donate today. <laughs> we need all the, all the ACLs we can get. <laughs> all the ACLs we can get. Do you have an ankle for Jimmy G? Have you looked at your ankle and said, you know, I don't really need this ankle as much as I thought I did? Well, Jimmy G needs yours now. Donate yours today. <laughs> all right. Raymond, uh, this is actually our second time recording this episode. We actually recorded this episode on Monday night only to realize that there was uh, some technical issues. I had told Raymond yesterday that this was an episode that one of the episodes I dreaded recording the most and my gift from the gods was to get to record it again. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> they heard you. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Oh, don't like it, huh? Well, now you get to do it twice. So here we go. We're recording this episode again on Tuesday morning, September 22nd. Uh, Raymond, why don't you let them know where can they find us? You can follow us on Twitter at the underscore Goldcast or Instagram at the Goldcast. And you can also subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Anywhere that podcasts are syndicated, we are located there. Our entire five-year catalog is all uploaded to the interweb. So like, subscribe, and comment because we certainly want to get your take on what was a, I'm going to say, I, I believe this is an understatement when I say a bittersweet victory this past Sunday against the Jets over in Jersey. But um, chime in. YouTube is the place where people like to gravitate for that conversation. You can always reach out to us directly, but YouTube is where everybody congregates, and that's kind of where we have the most fun talking to you guys, just because there's a lot of good comments, especially those of you who have been listening for a long time. We always appreciate you chiming in, so we certainly want to get your take, because we know that you're probably feeling similar to how we're going to show you in today's episode. Yeah, definitely a uh, brutal, brutal victory. I've never felt more bummed out about a 31-13 and 13 win uh, ever that, uh, than I can remember, for sure. Yeah, my score prediction was almost right on, but uh, I don't feel good. I, it's almost like you and I are getting together to discuss a loss. That's how it feels. Yeah, 100%. It really does feel like that. Um, all right, so here we go. Time to talk about a brutal, brutal Sunday. Your professor of fanalism, he's in the building. The greatest fanalist in the game, he's here too. Class is in session. Let's go. This is, it is the Gold Cast. Boom! Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Suisa III, and with me is my brother, my co host. Raymond Solis the first, baby. Boom. All right, Ray. As unless you've been living under a rock, you are aware of just what a catastrophic Sunday Sunday was for the 49ers. We ended up the in we went into Sunday with a variety of of injuries and left Sunday with a victory, but a hell of a lot more injuries. And to our arguably our best offensive and defensive players all going down. And I'm talking about Nick Bosa, torn ACL for the year. I'm talking about Jimmy G, even Raheem Mostert, even Tevin Coleman. Uh, I mean, the and the list goes on from there. Uh, let's start with just a little bit of a recap of the game, Ray. So, you know, going into this game, uh, we had mentioned, obviously, last week, our wide receivers really struggling to, to get open against Arizona and us looking, you know, it, it looked pretty rough. We signed Muhammad Sanu uh, over the course of the week, and we begin this game uh, with a huge Raheem Mostert run as he does virtually every game. I don't understand how he opens every game with like a 75 yard touchdown. He does this like every freaking week. It's so impressive. I'm feeling pretty excited. I'm feeling like, you know what? This is what a great start. Here we go. And things were kind of chugging along 
until Nick Bosa goes down. And when he went down, you know, he you know, he's he kind of gets twisted in the middle of uh of the pileup and and I'm thinking, okay, that looks like a like a like a sprained knee. Uh, you know, that's what I was thinking. He gets carted off the field, which is never a good sign. Getting carted off is never ever a good sign. And so I'm still thinking, okay, not that big of a deal. Then who goes down right after right after Nick Bosa? Oh, Solomon Thomas goes down. Yeah, two plays later. Yeah, he same goes, injury. Yeah, he goes down. Then the next play. Then after that, they sack Jimmy G. And I saw even in the sack, I saw his face grimace, and I thought, "Ooh, that was that looked weird. That looked super weird." He gets up, and they show on the replay his ankle kind of buckles funny. And it ends up being he this for him, he ends up playing the entire first half. But I'm getting RG3 flashbacks. I mean, he is hopping on one leg for the rest of the first half. And he balls out at one point. He was like seven for seven or eight of eight for 77 yards and uh, was looking really good, considering the fact that after every single play, he was hopping around on one leg and he, he was getting bashed it wasn't uh, in addition to that in addition to basically playing on one leg he's also getting hit and blown up every he only got sacked once and that one sack happened to be the definitive sack that gave him the ankle injury in the first place but even after that the offensive line was doing a horrible job absolutely horrible job with the pass protection rushing his throws thank god he was just threading the needle and getting the ball out quick but at the same time, he was getting blown up after all those plays and trying to protect his leg at the same time. It was just not an ideal scenario. But for some reason, Jimmy G actually played better under that kind of intense duress. And he tends to, with the exception of not every game because he's human, but he does tend to play a bit better after taking some big hits. And I know he's in, said in the past that he's enjoy, he enjoys getting tackled and he enjoys the physicality of football. So perhaps some of that. Um, kind of elevates his level of play because maybe it's you know it's it's feeling the pressure literal pressure of the opposing defense coming at him that kind of makes him kind of feel like all right I've got to really I got to really zone in my receivers and get the ball out in time and make some plays and push us downfield so I don't know what it is but whatever it is Jimmy's definitely got some moxie and definitely took some big licks and made some big time throws in that first half of the ball game but but man does the offensive line need to clean that up going forward. Yeah, he he gets us to the end of the first half. I think I think pretty sure the score was twenty one six at the end of the first half. Um, and that, like I said, the whole time I, I I'm just on pins and needles, going, "Oh man, my God, this is this is nerve wracking." And uh, so the second half comes around. Nick Mullins comes out as the starting quarterback. No surprise there. And the uh unofficial well the the unofficial diagnosis the thing that we're like bleacher report and the updates and what everyone's saying is that they're fearing it's a torn acl for bosa and solomon thomas which was confirmed on monday and they believe it's an ankle issue a uh, high ankle sprain with jimmy g possibly out four to six weeks uh which is more bad news and then uh, we we managed to get through the game. Nick Mullins is serviceable. Jimmy G in his first half was 14 of 16, 131 yards, two touchdowns, zero interceptions on one leg. The guy that, uh, you know, the, the quarterback that uh, nobody believes in. He balls out. Um, Nick Mullins is serviceable. He goes 8 for 11, 71 yards, one interception. That was kind of a, like a classic Jimmy G style interception. It bounces off of who, who did Jarek McKinnon. Yeah, it was Jarek McKinnon. It went right head. through his hands. To be honest, when you look at the replay, Jarek McKinnon, by all means, should have caught that ball. He didn't have to, like, out. He wasn't, like, outstretching Jarek McKinnon on that throw. Jarek McKinnon was flat on the turf, but he just missed it. He just basically muffed it. The ball went straight through his hands. So in a normal situation, or I'd say ideally, conventionally, especially knowing Jarek McKinnon's receiving capability, he should be able to catch that. But, you know, uh, he's missed football for a couple years. He's caught everything outside of that. So that's his first miss this season. Unfortunately, it was a big one because of where it landed. Ultimately, it didn't wasn't necessarily a deciding turnover. It just gave a tiny bit of hope of life to a Jets team that really is 
has a whole lot more issues than we do um, from top to bottom, including the coach. But uh, but at the same time, you know, definitely don't like to see plays like that. You 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 know, I'd rather have Nick kind of throw a boneheaded pick than have you know a potential play getting that that could have happened. We could have got the play, got the yardage, and instead it goes to the to the defender. So it's not even like we. That's one we gave away. I should say it's a turnover that we gave away. It's not a turnover that was necessarily earned by a deflection or just making a great jump on the ball. You know, the defender just happened to be in the right place at the right time, playing his zone, and the ball just went through Jarek McKinnon's hands. There you go. And so we, you know, the the Niners put another touchdown on in the fourth quarter. Jets put on one more. It was it was actually twenty one three. It was twenty one three at the end of the first half, even better than I remembered it. And so final score ends up being 31-13 in favor of the 49ers. But what a cost uh, it came with. Uh, this ga- this season so far very much has uh, Jim Harbaugh 2014 vibes to it a little bit. You know, I'm, you know it, it, it's starting to feel like the season from hell. Um, these injuries were po- started all the way back in training camp. Uh, we lost uh, we lost Jalen Hurd. Which was a which was a big one. Debo Samuel out for the month, and we kind of went into the season with that, and it has only continued uh, through these first two weeks. the The amount of injuries now we had uh, terrible injuries across the entire league. There was definitely a uh, there was there's definitely been a this is what happens when you don't have a preseason vibe to to what everyone's been talking yeah. about. That's kind of been the you know the major or, story or a full length off season program. Yeah, a full length off season program. Um, but in particular, it does look it, it is that this is not hyperbolic. The 49ers have have been the most decimated team uh, to start out the season, as you mentioned in our v- previous version of this recording. I have no doubt that our Super Bowl odds have dropped dramatically. Um, in the in these first 14 days, and so I've sp- I've spoken enough. I want to turn the mic to you. I know you have a lot to say, but um, how are you on this Tuesday uh, after what has been a really tough start to the season? Uh, concerned, I'm concerned because it's really tough to get back to the Super Bowl in back to back years as it is. You know, it's even more difficult if you if you are the loser the, on the losing end of that uh, potential return to the Super Bowl. And on top of that, you know, we went into this game without D Ford, without George Kittle, or George Kittle, you know, key components, Debo Samuel's been gone. Um, and so to come out of it, having still missing all those pieces and now adding Solomon Thomas and Nick Bosa to season ending injuries on top of also, you know, uh, an MCL sprain for Raheem Mostert. He'll be done. He'll be down for a couple weeks. Jimmy G is thankfully day to day. So that's good news. Uh, DJ Jones, our nose tackle, starting nose tackle. uh, He hurt his ankle. He's down right now. Don't know the status of him. Uh, D Ford also announced today as we speak is out for week three. So we know he's not going to return for a second week in a row. So that's unfortunate. Unfortunately, even though he's dynamic and he's incredibly fast and very good at what he does, he just cannot stay healthy. And it's like he doesn't even get injured on the field. It's always off the field stuff during practice, during his preparation phases where D Ford seems to have his issues right now. He's dealing with a neck before that. It was like, you know, the, the knee tendonitis or whatever that was going on that that doesn't seem to be the issue right now but now it's something else you know it's always something with him I don't get it I don't know if that's psychological or what but get in there and play is my is my advice because I I have a feeling you know this is someone that easily needs to be on the trade block coming this this coming off season in my opinion I know that's kind of a bit of a hot take this early in the season but we, we we acquired him via free agency for a reason, and that was to put some pressure on quarterbacks, and he's just not been able to fulfill uh, the role that we were hoping he would. He has at times when he's in there, but he's just not in there enough. So I have my frustrations with him right now, which is unfortunate because I really like him. I enjoy his press conference interviews. I like his overall personality, his attitude. It's, it's great. It's and he's great when he's Niners. healthy. Yeah, and he's fantastic when he's healthy. He's arguably one of the best in the league. He's definitely a top 10, hands down. But, uh, but that's unfortunate. We won't have him next week. Uh, thank God we're facing an inferior opponent because a great opponent, I think it would be, 
I would predict a loss if, if this was a better opponent with all the pieces missing. That's hard. We barely got we we did we barely kept up with Arizona and lost that game. You know, and now we have more pieces to add to that equation. You know, good luck when some of the better teams because Arizona is like a competent NFC West team, but they're not not all. You know, they're they're not even though they won this past weekend. You know, I still doubt their ability to hang with some of the upper echelon of teams, which we were a part of before the injury started happening. But like against the New Orleans, the Green Bay's, the Seattle's of the world, I don't and the, the Kansas City's of the world, I don't necessarily see them uh, standing up to par. You know, even Buffalo, I put in that category. Buffalo's had a fantastic opening season. They've played some pretty weak opponents, but they still look sharp. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, what's this going to mean? What's the length of time that we're talking about here? You know, Debo's or D Ford. There's no timetable for his return, so we don't know when he's coming back. That was the diagnosis we got today. Not only is he out for Sunday against the Giants, but there is no ETA on when he'll come back. So just a, an unfortunate waste of roster space as it is right now. If he comes back week four and is able to contribute, great. I'll shut my mouth and enjoy the sacks. But until then, you know, he's going to get he's going to be on the shit list, I think, right now, and, and deservedly so. Um Hopefully, Bosa and Solomon, you know, at least it's early in the season, which means they should be ready to go for the start of next year. So that's good news. Otherwise, you know, if this was in the middle of the season, then we wouldn't expect him back to the middle of next year. I mean, no matter how you slice it, it's not a good injury and it's not a good timetable for for their return. Um, Bosa, the had, time, Bosa had injuries. Uh, he was dealing with injuries in college. I mean, you know, that, that was just, that was right. He had like a torn or some kind of messed up abdominal muscle that he was dealing with, which is what sidelined him for part of his college career. And the Bosa's do have a history of injury. You know, it's not just exclusive to Nick, his brother over in LA, you know, he's had injuries the past couple of years, but when these guys are healthy, they are top five pass rushers in the league, which is why Bosa got paid over in LA. He got paid for a reason. When he's healthy, he's extremely dominant, extremely explosive, very hard to stop. And the same you could say for Nick Bosa, who many believe has a higher ceiling than his brother. So, you know, hope, you know, thoughts on him. And we know it's not ideal for him. Obviously, he wants to be out there contributing. So he's going to have a long road of recovery. But at least he's got Solomon Thomas with him, another high draft pick, number three overall, a couple years back, who hasn't really panned out all that well. And he's had some extenuating circumstances to contribute to that, you know, his uh, his shortcomings. But at the same time, you know, he seems to, it, at the same time, it also seems like he's just kind of struggling either with the system or his role or the NFL in general or a mixture of all three of those things. But uh, hopefully he has a good recovery and comes back stronger. Um but with that said, you know, maybe we can get back to the positives here in a little bit. You know, George Kittle's probably not going to play this year. The, the field is sticky. The I mean, field, this week. This week, you know, the, the, field, uh, the field was sticky as everyone was describing it. No one was happy about it. Eric Armstead uh, definitely gave some choice words about the Jets field after the game on Sunday. You know, and uh, there was a lot of misfortune that just kind of fell on the 49ers um, even after the game. The, the MRI truck that was supposed to go out yesterday morning. Um, there was issues with that. I think it got like damaged or something like that. And that so got delayed. The MRI truck got hurt. Is what you're saying. It got injured yes. on the way to do its job. The MRI truck got injured on the way to diagnose the injured players. So <laughs> it was not able to diagnose them on time. The plane, some, there was some kind of damage done to the plane they were supposed to take. So, uh, the plane that got was delayed by, by six hours. Yes. The, the, so the plane got injured before it could arrive on time to take the players to their, um, their basically their their training facility for the week before Sunday's game against New York, and uh, uh, so Ray. Just... Uh, also, we recorded this episode yesterday, and the audio files got injured. <laughs> yeah. and we had to re-record yes, this. It has been a domino effect <laughs> of really a series of unfortunate events that have plagued. Whether you're a fan, it seems that no one is immune to what's happening with the Niners right now. It seems that what's going on with the Niners is highly contagious to fans and everyone who is associated with them right now. So um, at least no one has COVID. I mean, that's the one thing we can say that's a positive. I, I no mean, that, that, that's the now. least of my concerns at this point. I mean, knock, knock on wood. But um, not, how the hell is knocking on wood going to even stop that you know, in, in the grand scheme of things? How's this going to – I don't know if this is really going to do anything. But I don't know. People say it. And I'm going to stop saying that. 
<laughs> is that the, I don't think that works. But um, it's been a tough it's been a tough day. But there are some positives that came out of Sunday, which we do want to talk about. We just wanted to get all the tough stuff out of the way right now because we know that that's on everyone's mind. It's really hard to kind of look forward to the season, especially as we approach the gauntlet with, with all of these injuries. Hopefully, if, if some of these guys, if the guys who are not long term injuries like Nick Bosa and Solomon Thomas, if Ford, Kittle, Debo, when all those guys get back, Jimmy is obviously going to come back. When all those guys come back, DJ Jones, when those guys come back, we actually do have a shot here. Um, and and the 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 hope is that somebody who's playing instead, in the stead of Bosa and Thomas, step up and are able to add some semblance of, you know, continuity uh, of the void that those players are going to leave. Then we actually do have a shot here. But as it stands right now pretty tough pretty pretty darn difficult uh, to look forward to the games here but at the, at the same time the the one of the silver lining is a this is happening early and not later or mid-season and b we have you know a really easy schedule in this first quarter of the season to help you know counterbalance some of the missing components and get them ready for the tougher opponents in the the mid and latter half of the season absolutely you're 100 percent correct about that we that is the one thing that we can look forward to, and let's 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 talk about some of the positives here as we uh, as we enter the the twilight of this episode. The the Niners, we had one goal, right, and that was take out the Jets, get back on the positive side, get to five hundred, and let's get through the next three weeks, right? With the this is the great news is that we've we've defeated the Jets. Now we have to take out the Giants, and then we have the Eagles and the Dolphins. If we can get through the next three weeks undefeated and basically to four and one we're sitting pretty we're sitting we super are. pretty we are the gauntlet Those are teams that everyone's beating up on right now yeah uh you know unfortunately saquon barkley went down which really sucks for saquon barkley such a talented running back a huge you know a huge basically the new york giants offense runs through saquon yeah, barkley the crutch of where their entire offense flows from so with that gone i think again not that I am glad that he's injured, but it does. It is going to take some pressure off the banged up 49ers defense heading into the Sunday, missing three key starters. Yeah, which we'll talk about a lot more on Thursday's uh, preview episode. But we, you know, the the great news is, is that we've got three very winnable games that will allow this team to to rest up and heal up because the gauntlet two, and I'm gonna pull it up right now. The gauntlet two it week six. Be begins week six, and when you've got in this order the Rams, the Patriots, the Seahawks, the Packers, the Saints, the Rams. That is no joke. And so, but if we can come back with everybody that is available, fully healthy, ready to go by week six, and we're sitting at four and one, I see no reason why we can't just pick up where we left off. That's the good news. But we have got to got to got to get healthy. I mean, it is it is it, it, th this is a very dire state right now. And again, we don't have that that mon that many tough guys to go through right now. We really don't. This is this is all all winnable games, all beatable opponents. We just have to hang on for three more weeks, and hopefully everyone's back by then. Hopefully, Jimmy. I I think you keep Jimmy out no matter what, for sure. Um, but hopefully everyone's back. But let's talk about some positives, Raymond. Defense played great. Defense was solid. Offense kicked some ass. You know, you said this uh, yesterday, and I, I'm a yes, Andrew, and I'm going to toss the mic back to you. Jarek McKinnon really starting to look like he's the guy that we wanted. You know, as long as he, hopefully he can stay healthy, uh, knock on wood. As you said, like to say, uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> or just you know, put a brace on him and monitor his ass every day. Yeah, that's more effective than knocking on wood. Uh, Nick Mo <laughs> Nick Mullins was serviceable. You know, as I mentioned, eight eight for 11, 71 yards. You know, he 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 didn't shit the bed, which is kind of what we need him to do. Uh, the defense, awesome. You know, Fred Warner with the with a big game. Jimmy Ward with the uh, with a solid game. Akella Witherspoon. You know, our one sack of the day coming from Eric Armstead, all solid, uh, so solid performances. And in general, uh, had, had had everyone stayed healthy, I would have been 
ecstatic, been like, solid. We, solid. You know, we probably would have put a couple more touchdowns on the board had Jimmy stayed yeah. healthy and really, really, really put this game away. But as we mentioned before, with a team like the Jets, you're supposed to dominate them. You know, and I, I said, I was saying before the game that if we dominate the Jets, I'll feel good. If we barely get by the Jets, I'll feel nervous. And if we lose to the Jets, I'm going to be in a full-on panic. Well, luckily, it was the first option. We dominated the Jets, even with all those guys going down, even with basically our second and third right. stringers out there, we right. still kick their ass. So that's good right. news. Yeah, and it's a combination of two things. You know, I want to be fair here. I don't want to give a sense of false hope. But uh, the Niners have a lot of talented depth um, on this football roster. And that's really one of the things that kept us going when we had dealt with a bunch of injuries midway through last year. You know, remember, George Kittle was injured last season, too. Uh, so was Debo Samuel at times. And so was Kyle Juszczyk at times. So it wasn't a pretty Trent Taylor was gone all year last season. So he was not there. And defensively, D. Ford was intermittent, you know, all season long. Uh, uh, Quan Alexander was lost for half the year with his torn uh, uh, pec muscle. Uh, it, so, you know, we had a fair share of injuries. Joukowsky Tart was also injured uh, during parts of the season. DJ Jones uh, was injured. Ronald Blair was injured last year. A lot of good guys, good depth guys that were injured last season. But we kept humming along because of the talented depth on this roster. And even though this Jets team is really depleted talent-wise, you know, they didn't have Jamison Crowder, their best slot receiver. They didn't have Le'Veon Bell, one of the best dual running backs in the NFL the past five years you know they didn't have either of those two guys to help out sam darnold but at the same time the second and third stringers that were playing there still were able to keep this team at bay and not give them any semblance of progress despite all the losses because richard sherman did not play in this game at all um and nick and then we lost nick bosa and solomon thomas in the first quarter in three plays so you had a lot of starters gone early in this contest, and still we were able to just hold them to 13 points. They had that late touchdown in the fourth quarter, garbage time, irrelevant. Um, I thought it would be something like 27, 31 to 10. Um, so the, the score prediction was pretty close. So I think it's a testament to the depth of this roster. But at the same time, part of it is because we were playing an opponent, an opponent that's just really depleted. And next week, I really do, you know, not want to get ahead of ourselves, but next week there's a, there's a fair chance that it'll kind of be the same thing next week. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see. But uh, I really liked what I saw out of Fred Warner uh, this past Sunday. He was all over the place. He led the team with 12 combined tackles, um, three assists. Uh, Kerry Hyder, a new name on the roster this season. He's been playing very well, I thought. He's been making some p plays in the backfield there. So uh, I really uh, like what I'm seeing from him. Quan Alexander played better as the game went on. Kind of struggled in the beginning, let Gore get past him on a couple plays, but played a lot better as the game went on. Um, so I appreciate that uh, out of him. Uh, he had even had a tackle for a loss there. Eric Armstead was great, um, had a lot of pressures, pass deflections, including the sacks. So he's, uh, you know, doing what he does best. So thank God he's kind of doing what, what he's been doing. Um, Givens also played pretty well, had a TFL in that game too. Emmanuel Mosley had a couple pass deflections. Good job on him. Kawan Williams, even though it didn't blow up the stat sheet, you know, his presence is good. He's he's a contributor there. So he didn't give up big plays, which is great. Keller Willispoon, you know, s still continues to kind of be a liability there on the other side of the corner spot position. But we'll just have to see if Richard Sherman's ready to play in this next week. Oh, wait, no, he's gone. Isn't he down for a couple weeks too? Yeah, he's on IR. So he's gone gone for a couple weeks. So it's really up to Akello and perhaps the backups to really kind of step in and keep that side going. We know that Akello's capable. He started off so good last year and then, you know, got blown up a couple plays and just lost his confidence and ended up losing his job to Emmanuel Mosley and didn't even and couldn't even start in the playoffs or the Super Bowl. That was given to a Mosley, you know, who ends up giving up some big plays too. But at the same time, it was much more consistent and reliable than Akello Witherspoon, even though Akello kind of has the size and makeup and dimensions that we typically like in a cornerback. But for some reason, you know, it's just I think he just deals with some confidence issues. That's what it seems like to me, which then affects his technique and being in the right spot at the right time. But uh, overall, he was top four on the defense this past weekend in tackles and contributions. So he is contributing. 
um, whether it's not optimal or not, you know, con contribution is a contribution and he's all we've got. So he's the next best option. So we'll just have to deal with it. And, uh, but overall, um, really good, uh, defensive performance. They did exactly what I thought that they would do. Um, and offensively, you know, I'll let you sound off and get us started on the offensive part, but I have a lot of things to say about the offense too, because, uh, they were able to, to keep going without, uh, without really missing too many beats. Well, couple things that we we discussed before that we both like the uh jarek mckinnon definitely yeah. starting to put it explosive. together explosive uh, is how i would describe him he looks explosive he, relative to where he was and what he's projected to be capable of according to john lynch and kyle shanahan he looks every bit just like they described and back-to-back -back touchdowns and back-to-back -back games so awesome to see that very good production out of him very good production he you know three carries 77 yards i mean talk about efficiency uh you know d to compare raheem mostert was eight carries for 92 yards he basically he's got almost the same exact uh, amount with, with five less carries you got kendrick Bourne had a big day f four receptions 67 yards averaging 16.8 yards a carry excellent the other guy stepping up from 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 also a time machine, Jordan Reed, seven receptions for fifty yards, excellent. You know, Coleman not so bad. Brandon Ayuk got in there a little bit, two two receptions for twenty one yards. I expect more out of him. I think we're just going to see more and more coming out from him. But and he's he's he flashed some yak ability in his season debut. Uh, there was the pass Alver, and when he was over into the flat, um, he was almost a flat. Yeah, it looked like a sideline throw. He caught it, juked a guy, was able to get some extra yardage out of it. So love to see that. D D Debo Samuel's got that ability. George Kittle's got that ability. Jordan Reed did an amazing George Kittle imp impersonation this past Sunday. Two touchdowns. He was really the bulk of the passing offense. We had two in the air, two on the ground, 182 yards total on the ground. So we dominated the ground game. 200 yards passing. So very Kyle Shanahan-esque type of game, where meaning, i.e., not so fantasy friendly, but definitely uh, real life uh, NFL friendly. Which is what matters the most which is matters the most. Um, so uh, really good game overall by the offense. Mm -hmm. they, they really kept everything humming despite all the odds that are getting thrown at them. So a testament to the coaching staff and the team for everyone to just hang in there, hang together. They've obviously been through worse. So, so that's the, that's another silver lining about this too. They've been, you know, losing five games straight of three points or less. You know, they know what it's like to lose tight games and to just always be on the short end of the stick. And they have enough talent on this roster, enough polish to really overcome some of these adversities because not everybody is done for the year. They're just they just not going to be there, you know, for the first quarter of the season. But once they come back, this team's going to have, you know, a much better shot at getting through that gauntlet, which I know everyone's thinking about. You know, don't think too far ahead. You know, right now is the Giants. You know, that's the focus. And this is a very beatable team. Very beatable, absolutely, and I think that's where our focus needs to be. Uh, like you said, don't get too far ahead. Don't doom and gloom us. Um, but it is a little – it's a frustrating start to the season more than anything. But a lot of positives to take away, a lot of – a, a much stronger performance from the 49ers is what we're, what we're hoping for. And let's hope that the pieces they put around Nick Mullins – Nick Mullins is a leader, had a great post postgame uh, – uh, kind of rally conversation with the team at the end of uh, at the end of the oh, game. I didn't see that. Oh, I'll have to check that yeah, out. Yeah, check it out on Instagram. It was good stuff. And uh, he he got the team uh, super pumped, and they all cheered and rallied around him, and were grabbing him and stuff. And you know, he's a leader, and he's got very strong leadership capabilities. Yeah, and definitely and, capable of starting on another NFL roster. You he, know, he's that he's that he's that good. He's a solid, definitely a. Very competent backup, but uh, arguably could be a starter in this league, in my opinion. And and had some great passes on Sunday. I thought he looked he looked serviceable. He he held the team together. He kept the team together. So I'm all for Nick Mullins getting us through maybe one or two more games. I've got no problem with it, especially against these opponents. I think he's more than capable of defeating the Giants and the Eagles if, you know, as long as he can keep it together. The Eagles look yeah, like the wheels I, are spinning I, off of that I, team I, too. Yeah, I, and I think if you're Kyle Shanahan, you kind of roll with you roll the dice 
which is not much of a risky dice, but you kind of roll with, you know, your backups and your depth to carry you through these next couple weeks and just kind of give your stars time to rest properly and don't prematurely bring them into the back into the fold and risk further injury. I think because because of the luxury we have right now with the way that the schedule's lined up and who our opponents are, I think it would be it would be in the team's best interest to really take advantage of that and kind of let the depth uh, let the depth take over right now because they're more than capable. They showed that against the Jets um, early on, and I think they could definitely handle the Giants. I think so too. I'm I'm not I I. I'm worried about the overall season. I'm not super worried about the next week. And and the more I talk about it and the more I kind of lay it out and we kind of I it's like my confidence builds the more I go, "Okay, look, look at our next three opponents. Look at the look at the weapons we have on offense. You know, these guys should all be back like I I want to get to the gauntlet 4 and 1. And if we get to the gauntlet 4 and 1 and everyone's back, then for me the season resets right. and it's like we're, right. we're we're right back in the hunt. You know, yeah, we're right back sh- and in- this yeah exactly uh, and that's there's optimism here there's room for op- legitimate optimism not just fanboy optimism but legitimate optimism and i think part of that too is like we're in week 3 remember week 4 is the projected allowable return for debo samuel and richard sherman if they're ready to go then boom we have two big pieces coming back we have a solid cover man on one side, Emmanuel Mosley's been very good on the other side, and we're going to get uh, a big receiving weapon back to really uh, get some pressure off of the younger guys who are still coming up. But at the same time, Debo Samuel's presence is really going to open up more opportunities for the rest of us because right now it's easy for defenses to kind of scheme against a roster that they're not necessarily scared of, you know, or at least they don't know about. They don't know about Brandon Ayuk. They don't know. They're not scared of Trent Taylor. They're not scared of Kendrick Bourne. Although these are guys that can produce, but with a dynamic player like Debo Samuel there who um, participates in the running game in addition to the passing game, I think that opens up a lot of one-on-one opportunities for the likes of George Kittle and Jordan Reed. Good luck with both of those tight ends out there if you're an opposing defense in the next three weeks or any week, really. Um, Those are two dynamic pass-catching tight ends that can get yards after the catch and score at will. So um, that'll be good to have both of them back there really kind of mixing things up. And that that's really, to me, that's what's going to be those are going to be the components. Uh, so next week is a really big week because if we get Debo back, that's going to really allow the offense to start really start humming, humming good. And that's what I think is really going to set the tone for the season progress of Trent Taylor, Kendrick Bourne, and Brandon Ayuk. Those are kind of the three components. Mohamed Sanu was there. He played, but he was a ghost out there. So not much out of him. Or at least, you know, I didn't see his name. His name is not even on, yeah, he, he, he wasn't even targeted. So um, maybe he, may, I think it was too tight of a window. We know that Emmanuel Sanders came in. He actually had a week to prepare and then actually had a little bit of action against Carolina, even scored a touchdown in the opening drive. So we know that he was able to contribute early on as soon as he got uh, in his first game. Mohamed Sanu, not the same thing because now we have COVID protocols. There was a lot of extra protocols in place right now that kind of, delayed the process of him getting acclimated so i think with the short turnaround i think if anything they just kind of use him as a decoy maybe throw him out there to mix him up keep the uh keep the keep the secondary honest over there uh, on the jets so we'll see i think he's definitely going to get into the mix this coming week though so we'll we'll see how that pans out too but i think there's a lot to look forward to i didn't want we didn't want to make this all doom and gloom um, the offense performed admirably. The running game is looking great. Even though Raheem Mostert's not there, this means Jeff Wilson's going to get more into This is going to be the Jeff Wilson, Jarek McKinnon running game going forward. So we know, and Jarek McKinnon's probably going to lead that, lead the first and second down run attempts. And then Jeff Wilson maybe comes in for uh, the, the later downs. That's how I see it panning out. Jeff Wilson did play this past Sunday. Didn't really contribute much on the stat sheet, but that's because he was overshadowed by McKinnon and Mostert's performances. But now with Mostert and Tevin Coleman down for the next few weeks, this is going to be a one-two punch of Jarek McKinnon and Jeff Wilson Jr. So not bad, not bad. We, we liked we all, we all can agree that we've liked Jeff, Jeff Wilson coming out of there. He, we just had such a deep running back uh, stable that he just didn't get a lot of opportunity. 
injuries. You know, he had to be relegated to special teams, but now with the injuries, he gets to step in and contribute more, more so with his true role uh, versus his support role on special teams. Absolutely. And definitely, like you said, there are uh, enough pieces there that we should be able to handle the Giants going forward. So lots to look forward to, Raymond. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, last thing I want to say, and I want to keep this real brief because we're pretty much at time, but uh, I did want to congratulate the Oakland A's for clinching the AL West. Yeah, well done. Congrats. Another Bay Area team. Um, First time in seven years, I think. Mm-hmm, since 2013 and looking very dominant. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, hopefully they can get Billy Bean his first World Series. I would totally root for the Oakland A's. I'll put my bias aside when they go to the postseason and mm-hmm. root for them. Giants yeah, are still I, in the hunt, and uh, let's hope they can they are. keep it together too. They managed to salvage some dignity too by uh, g- giving it uh, – giving it giving their all on Sunday to salvage the three-game series and avoid the sweep from the A's because the A's kicked the shit out of them the first two games, blanking them in back-to-back games and putting up more than enough runs uh, to to win those uh, both those contests. But the Giants came right back, and the offense was finally able to wake up and really kind of give a, a good uh, a counterpunch back to that stellar A's pitching uh, lineup. Yeah, save so, themselves um, so, a little bit of dignity, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's no good. I mean, those first two games were brutal, but it's a testament to how deep that Oakland A's pitching roster is. They just have great pitching, and great. they're a perfect balanced team right now, and uh, pitching is what's really going to win you a title in MLB, and the A's look poised to really uh, give a good run for that. We'll just have to see if they can get through the playoffs. That's been their Achilles heel the past decade, or two decades, I should say, dating all the way back to the 2000, early 2000 team with the big three, Zito, Mulder, and Hudson. But uh, we'll see. Different team, different era. Hopefully they don't let uh, the superstition creep up in there because uh, I think they've definitely got enough pieces there to, to get the title. Well, we shall see. All right, folks. So let us know what did you think about this game? Uh, were you excited about the offensive pieces you did see? Uh, how nervous are you? Can we get through the next three weeks with Nick Mullins and be ready in time for the gauntlet too? Let us know in the comments. Go to youtube.com slash the gold cast and tell us what you think. And so concludes another edition of the gold cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Slisa III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa first, baby. Boom. We'll see you next time. Same Goldcast time, same Goldcast channel.